graphic design? Can you make a living at that? Three, two, one, fun, 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 Welcome to Design Futures, a show about what happens after design school. I'm Chris St. Cyr, and my guest on this episode is Larry Wenz. Great to see you. Great seeing you, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Larry is a partner and creative director of Outfit Branding and Design, where he directs projects across print web and environmental platforms for clients such as Hallmark Greetings, American Red Cross, Ed Hardy, and the International Cricket Council. His work has been featured on the websites Behance Packaging, The Dye Line, and Brand New. And his work is also included in the Brand New Brand book. Larry is a 2005 graduate of the University of Denver. There we go. Ooh, go DU. Right? Yeah, DU. <laughs> yeah, nobody calls it the University of Denver, right? I want to start with company. I, I should say also, you do this work uh, with Outfit with your wife and partner. Uh, Wendy Tuan. So yeah. can you uh, can you talk a little bit about how the two of you uh, started the company, kind of like what the immediate history is? Yeah. So, you know, we're a husband and wife team, which has its pros and cons. I think you you probably know yourself <laughs> with two I know that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And obviously it's always a net benefit. And I think what really helps though is that we actually, we met at work. We both used to work for a company called Philip Simon Development. We worked on footwear development and also other aspects too. Like we were kind of their graphic design house. I think that really helps in terms of understanding the professional environment that you have and the way that you work with one another and, and your strengths and weaknesses. And I, we've always worked really well together and we always worked well in terms of collaboration and complementing each other. Like Wendy is certainly more of this left side of the brain where, or the right side of the brain, sorry, where she's definitely m- much more artistic and she kind of has a more creative perspective and she has a fine arts degree from Berkeley. And she sort of thinks, I, I feel like she sees things in a much more organic sort of fine arts sort of way. For me, I'm very analytical, I'm very strategic and um, I like to, I love design because it marries these sort of two different areas. And I think that helps us in, in terms of the, what the design discipline is, which is sort of this marriage of problem solving and looking at challenges, but also taking imagination and creativity and, add, and adding humanity to work. We always recognized that we had a good relationship and, and I had been working as a creative director for a company called Seymour Duncan that's up in Santa Barbara. I was a little bit burnt out after a while from working there. It was always like constant projects. And and for me, I felt that wasn't my passion. And I had realized from working there because I helped them rebrand. And looking at that company, everything was like really inconsistent. And so we want to unify it. And I, I was thinking it was it was weird to dive in as like my first major branding project was, was doing this 36 year old company that hadn't done branding in like 10 years because they have 150 stakeholders and we had to do interviews and we did stakeholder interviews and it was like just jumping off the deep end. Um, and I said, I love this work, I, but I really love it. Like I love the research. I love speaking to people. I love hearing about why they love the organization and then synthesizing and manifesting that into something visual or something about messaging and, and almost like creating some sort of country, like you're creating a country and sort of culture around, that's what brand identity is. It's sort of like an ethnographic part of it where you're really sort of observing how people work as, as an organization and trying to make something out of it. So I, I approached my wife and we had just gotten married and I was thinking, gosh, we're going to have kids soon. And I really want to do something that is sort of my dream, which is always to have my own company and some of my own firm. I've always worked for other people in house. And I said, let's, how about we, you know, like you have great illustrative skills and you have graphic design and we, and you have great style and we work well together. How about I lead you on this adventure to start, start a branding company? And so we decided to do it. And I had to, I did this whole PDF presentation for her, my mother in law, for her mom, because she was like, I, it was weird because, you know, her parents are more traditional. I had to explain to them that I'm quitting my job in order to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, was, made a, you made a deck for the in-laws? 
I did. I said it was a whole introduction, and everything, because they're like, "Oh my God, this kid just married my daughter, and now she's trying to convince her to quit her job and do this." And and so I had a plan. I, I said, "I'm going to do this for six months. It's going to be." So I did it as a side hustle for six months, and I had right. a whole list. Of, I had a bunch of clients that were referrals, and we actually started out with a different name. We had a name called Public Marking. That was our original name. So we changed it to Outfit, which made a lot of sense for us because we have a background in fashion and. And we're an outfit of two people like it has and about branding identity is really about about representing yourself through like outfitting somebody with the equipping somebody with the ability to represent themselves and and in a truly authentic and sort of effective way that stands out and that's kind of where we are right now I think we've we've had our challenges and and interestingly we have a, a child we have a we have a daughter now we have a two-year-old now and I don't I think the number one thing we really like have fights about is really just work. We will fight over like a pixel or like right. a one, like a Pantone color typeface. or something. <laughs> yeah, typeface. And I have to feel lucky because those are things that we really argue about more and or about organizational things or, or about vision things yeah. and about business things. And I think those are things that we mostly have common ground on. But personally, we're, we're great. We're, we have such great chemistry and all those sort of things. And I think you can you can relate to that too. Is that the husband wife dynamic is really about about brutal honesty sometimes, oh, and yeah. also oh, about yeah. also being like understanding that they're a complete support system for you, and you can one hundred percent trust their yeah trust their opinion. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that last uh, word uh, you just used, support, is you know, it's one thing I'm curious about. You know, interviewing former students and. And what is their support system, right? Like every, you know, whether you're uh, 20 years out of school or three years out of school, right? Everybody needs a kind of support system. Uh, it might be for financial reasons. It might be for professional reasons or personal or, or whatever. You have to lean on on a support system. And and certainly the husband and wife team is is unique. You know, I, as you mentioned, I, I have that. Most people listening know that I work with my wife, Kelly McMurray at 2 Communique. And um, certainly, there's a unique kind of support system with uh, like the husband and, and wife team, which which reminds me of uh, one of our earlier conversations was you two went you went to Taiwan. Is that right? For part of the pandemic and, and sort of work there. And yeah, can you exactly. talk a little bit about that. How did you uh, live and work? And, you know, were your clients in Taiwan or were they U.S. based or, you know, what, what was that like? So we were locked down last year for like. 10 months or, or 11 months. But the thing is, we've never put our, our children in daycare. We've always taken care of our kids while running our business. So we had come up with our own system where we have these shifts, right? Like so half the day, she'll take on the kid and half the day, I'll take on the kid. And so you have like this big block of time where you can work. And that works, but it, it also is like super energy intensive. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think at the end of 2020, we were like, we need some support. I think we had to travel 8,000 miles. And <laughs> this is why the most expensive day, like daycare solution ever. So we went back. It was a really good decision because it wasn't just about getting support because support's really important, but it was a number of reasons for her to spend time with the grandparents and to go to Taiwan and, and for us to, at that time, Taiwan was, I think, number five country in the world to live during the pandemic because mm. they had locked down very soon. So everything was normal there. I think they had zero COVID deaths since for like a year, right? So we stayed there for something like six or seven months. And that really allowed, afforded us not only that hurt the time for, for our, our daughter to spend time with her grandparents, but also for us to get a little bit of decompression and to really work on like major projects that we wanted to work on. For that period of time, we really buckled down. We were able to do a lot of those sort of things that we wanted to do for so long that we couldn't do because, you know, because we have a, we had a kid that we were watching full time and, and so we have, you know, we were trying to balance a lot of things. So we were there for six or seven months. And, and I think, you know, we've done this before, actually. We had actually spent something like five or six months in Shanghai. We had gone just to visit a friend of ours in the November of that previous year. And that's another thing was if you are this, if you're working with your husband and wife, then you can always like, you have a lot more flexibility about where you can go because mm -hmm. you can always work everywhere, which is also a curse as well. Anyways, they, we were there and we had met just in the span of like a couple of days, we were there a few days, we had met so many people and so many great, interesting people in Shanghai. Shanghai is this very big ex 
patriot community of really future-minded entrepreneurs and people are trying to do things and it's like sort of its own economic zone so it has mm -hmm. this other culture to it we were very much enamored by that and thinking like there's an opportunity here to maybe expand our audience to seek new opportunities and we had already had success with we work in los angeles of uh, building our network so we spent five or six months there. We were originally only spent supposed to spend like two months there or something. And we kept on extending and extending it because it was some, it, we just gained like, that's where we, we worked with, like we worked with AB InBev there. We worked with like a, a, a huge like healthcare system that also did like hospitals. We worked like these really big projects. I mean, Chinese, like Shanghainese have like big eyes, like that's a city, it's a big international city where people are really, they're really trying to take over the world in terms of business. And so I felt like that really matched with our ability to, um, our ability to help ground these businesses and brand, help give them long-term strategic solutions that were more international. And that also gave us, considering my wife is actually Taiwanese and, and I, my parents are Vietnamese and, I, and we've been to a lot of places in the world, this helped really, I think it really helped cultivate more of an international perspective about how you approach design, that there are other languages besides English. <laughs> there are other, so there's like a typographic sense to it. There, that color means so many different things to other people. So it really helped sort of expand our visual palette, I, I suppose, and our, our ability to create work that could be appealing to different markets. And, and so I think that helped us uh, in, as, in terms of a pilot of, of being somewhere that's not Los Angeles for a long extended period of time. But the pandemic is so, has been so pervasive in the sense that when, you, when we were in Taiwan, we were much more buckled down. And this happens when you have, a, I think, a kid is that your time is a lot more, it's a, it's, it needs to be a lot more managed. And I think it was a very different experience this time, but it was very crucial that we had that sort of support. I think it's a thing with creatives where you need to change your environment in order to be creative. You need to get out side or you need to be in it somewhere else in order to stimulate different things because they're so visually sensitive and i think that really helped us to change our environment and so you're back in la now and so do you still have clients like in taiwan or shanghai or are they la based we recently did this big deep data dump of all of our clients the past seven years and a large majority are in the u.s and mm -hmm. But there was a large, like something like 20 or 25% were in, were in like Shanghai or in Taiwan. And, but we had clients in four different continents too. So we had, right. we had a client in Argentina. We had one in, we had a couple in, in Australia too, like the International Cricket Council. Yeah. And so I think for us, like internationalism has always been one of our core values. Let's uh, take a look at uh, some of your, some of your projects. So I pulled out a few. Yes. Yeah, so, so Bean Folk, this is one of the projects we did when we were in Shanghai and we're still really great friends with the, own, the owners and founders of this. They're also a husband and wife team, actually. <laughs> they import a very exotic bean. So like beans from Vanuatu or Papua New Guinea. And so for this company, we actually, this is the, this is a turning point in terms of our methodology, because I think to communicate, you guys probably know is that sort of there's this, there was during that time there was a sort of paradigm shift between being very like logo centric, and really taking it more on a system based sort of approach of doing that that branding is really about brand worlds like where you're having patterns and you're having colors and you're having typography and the interaction of all these different aspects. And this is a, one of the first projects where we really took that to the a new level where we, when we were presenting conceptual work, we were create we created something like four different concepts that each of them had their own typography and their own color. Mm -hmm. And so this this particular concept is the one that they chose. Well, we really looked at the tradition of Papua New Guinea using like a, a face painting and mm -hmm. of the bird, birds of paradise and these sort of feathers that feel, so we, we saw this sort of like visual commonality between these ink blots that we created, the sort of paint strokes and the way that feathers look and these sort of feathery looks of it and sort of this very passionate sort of almost bleeding of them. So we call them bleed feathers, but we also create these very natural drawings like nature-based topographical drawings that really spoke to sort of the environment and the wildness of the, of the origins of these beans. And they wanted something that felt very elevated as well. So we, we chose a very, uh, like a geometric sans serif that it's a sans serif called Sophia Pro and 
that's something I think really paired well with what they were trying to do, which was something a little bit more organic, but also have this sophistication and refinement to it. This is such a key project for us because this is a project that was somehow picked up by Behance as a feature for their, I think for, it was either graphic design or packaging. And it like kind of blew up on Behance. And then the die line saw it and they did a review on it. That was uh, like extremely nice. And somehow from the die line, I think brand new from under consideration picked it up. So they did a full, full review on it. That's like one of the yeah. things that you feel like is a dream for you. That you feel sort of this validation from your peers and your community because we have been doing it for so long. And I think those sort of things weirdly are, are part of feeling like this is a real profession and is like mm -hmm. having this validation. And from that brand new post, we actually got picked up by Gestalt and Verlag, which features us, featured us in that, that brand new brand book that just came out. And another book is coming out this year that has the same project that's about, it's on, I think it's on Amazon, which I'll send you a link for. It's called uh, Palette Perfect, which is about color. That's from this other imprint, this uh, book publishing company in Barcelona called Hawaki Books, and they they both of the both of those people approached us, and it was just such like a wild ride. We're actually yeah. going to be in a printed book that something we always dreamed of doing. One of the things I think I realized from doing all the projects we've done is that this people keep on coming back to this one, this other project we did, which was called Three Nineteen, and I think that's one of the tenets about our business is that I think you can be an excellent designer, but you also have to create work that is you're willing to take risk and, and do something bold and, and different from out there. I think that's why people were drawn to this project because it's yeah. sort of so different. <laughs> Where's 319? Oh, is it this one? Oh, there it is. Yeah, 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 that one. So very recently on Instagram, we got featured three or four times on different design pages for this project. All of a sudden, I don't know why, but <laughs> Behance was the one that picked up on this. This is the first project we got featured on Behance. And people love it. Like, I don't know, this is something we really was another project where it was a big budget project, a client that was willing to take on whatever we decided to do. And they're based in Cincinnati and in San Francisco. And they have, so they have two locations and they also do coffee as well. And, and so coffee, but their take on coffee is that it's sort of this very creative medium. And it has this history about coffee where a lot of intellectuals and like thinkers came together at cafes, right? So we drew upon that as being sort of this lineage uh, and this heritage of, of coffee being very creative and being something that's expressive and, and can kind of, and they also had us do this really expanded label part of it where we were doing different illustrative illustrations of different cities. So Wendy was like a huge component of this. I was doing more of the brand side and like putting the pieces together, but Wendy was just pumping out great illustration and different aspects of the brand to bring it to life. And I think that's been such a key part of what makes our projects sort of stand out are, are these illustrative aspects of it. And really looking at like pop art and looking at different influences and, and looking at how do we, how do we make this projects feel artistic and expressive and and that was really part of their story was that really they wanted something that could be a gift to somebody or it could they wanted to highlight artists that were in local communities and have events that were very much art focused but so they want to use coffee as as a means of like conversation about these sort of things this is the last one i pulled out i just it was different you know like there's a more of a publication aspect to this uh, and, and sports related, right? So yeah, it's about, about right. cricket. So what is this uh, International Cricket Council report? So International Cricket Council is like a organizational body that regulates cricket activities, right? And, and they put out, they want to put out this report that talks about their impact on, especially like developing and emerging markets. And this is only supposed to be I think we talked to Amanda about like about uh, scope creep. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is one of those projects. I where... could talk to every designer about scope creep. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of those projects. I think it was only supposed to be like twenty pages or something, and I think it ballooned to like uh, over a hundred or so. I can't remember. It was like this. Ma it ended up being this really massive project where we ended up. I mean, it was great for us because we charged them like. For every new iteration and it was we loved the project because it was impactful and it, and it was something that was sort of outside of our normal realm of what we usually do which is 
primarily about building brand assets and, and visual identity and strategy. Whenever we do some sort of marketing piece, we take this sort of a very similar approach where we're really thinking about, okay, what are the governing assets for how this book should look like? And we come up with a couple concepts about what the layout should be. We come up with a grid. We think of these different, you look at that cricket bat, like these different illustrative assets about like, how do we pepper it in with graphic assets that could bring the page life and really activate it. And one of the things is that I loved about this project is that it was highly typographic. It was almost like an academic journal. Mm-hmm. And you'll know, like, you know, Rafael Fajardo, he was one of my mentors in school. And I, ever since I had one of his classes, I always had this very, like, I always thought it was like typography as being this very noble discipline. Yeah. And uh, so for me, I felt like a typographic monk doing this because it was very, very much just like a very ambitious sport that has this very storied history. And try and translate that into sort of a typographic lay, layout sort of medium was a really wonderful thing for me. So Wendy, my partner, did all the different infographics too. And it was something that I felt it was another one of those projects that was this real marriage of of our talents and skills and, and sort of our viewpoints, because she was able to sort of take on this more illustrative aspect of it with, with taking information and, and making it interesting to look at. And for me, really building out systems and type, typography and layout into ways that could make this not just a dry academic read, but something that could really engage people in almost an editorial way. It's wonderful to see just the range of work. And, and there's definitely like, there's this kind of boldness and, you know, the boldness to the, the layout, the typography, the colors, and it seems really consistent in, uh, in a, lot of your, a lot of your work in, in the portfolio. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's really good work. It's just, uh, it's great to see, you know, it's part of my curiosity with reconnecting with, with students, former students is, you know, what, what are they been working on? What are they designing? What are they actually making, you know? And it's great to see that as well as like, you know, like I consider like making a company, like that's, that's making something right. Making, making, uh, you know, the side hustle or, or making, a, you know, in the broader sense, making a life, you know, like what have you been doing, you know, uh, since, since uh, the DU days. Right. So, so that's, that's a lot about uh, where you are now with outfit of branding and design. And so when you left DU when you graduated, what's that part in between you know, graduation, undergrad to, you know, starting your company. You were, you mentioned you worked for a couple companies. So uh, what, what was that like and how did that kind of lead you to where you are now? When you, when you leave sort of the comfort of the campus of DU, you're sort of in the wild a little bit. I, I wish I had spent more time doing internships and I had done internships, but I think with the DU program, it was so experimental and, and, it was, I had a fine, it was a BFA. So I was doing a lot of fine arts and I also had done the DMS pro- program to so digital media studies. And I think part of me was very much focused on the discipline and very much about the work itself. And I think there was still, I had, I think my case level was good in terms of like what looked good, but I was thinking like, well, my abilities were like, there's this gap, like my abilities sure. were not there. Yeah. It was bad. At that point, I think what happened was, uh, I don't remember, do you remember a student named Melissa Diner? I don't know if you remember her. I don't recognize that. Name. I don't know. She was, she was in a DMS program, so I don't oh, know okay. if she overlapped with you too much. But she had moved to Los Angeles, and my sister had moved to Los Angeles. I had come out to visit her, uh, my sister, and and I had just said, um, I, I, I said, let's meet up. I talked to Melissa, and I was like, hey, hey let's meet up. And she's like, hey, listen. Uh, I'm working for this company. This is about six months after I graduated. And she said, hey, I'm working for this company called Philip Simon and we do footwear development and we need somebody to do the graphics for it. And I was like, yeah, I'll just do it. I'll take whatever. <laughs> like at that point, right. like you're still, you're still hungry for like a job. Sure. I had done a few interviews at that time, but it wasn't getting anywhere. And I was like, man, like, what am I going to do? And I was like, oh, thank God. This company, Philip Simon, they were really small at that time. And they literally needed somebody just to do CAD drawings of their shoes and somebody to do their collections. And it really wasn't like designing, it was because the, the boss at the time, he was also, it was such, it was like a five person company and, or three or four person company. He was just like, I want you to take this shoe that I have in my hand and change out so I can change the colors and the patterns and stuff like that. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I can definitely do that. And I had never designed a shoe in my entire life. And I was like, I'll, yeah, I could do it. <laughs> like, can you design shoes? I'm like, yeah, I can do it. Because you're just like faking it until you make it. 
And the first day was like the most intense because this guy, this guy was such a crazy guy. He was like standing behind me as I was working, <laughs> like as I was doing over it, the like, shoulder breathing, designing, like, yeah, literally breathing down my neck for the entire day. Oh, Luckily, do you gave me a great up to like. I think I understood the pressure and I was able to go through. I ended up working for them for four years or something. I grew up, like, I actually grew to be their design director. I, I managed a department. That's where I met Wendy. And we, I ended up doing all kinds of stuff, like their marketing collateral. I, originally, I was their one-man graphic design team. So I was doing catalogs and doing branding and doing, because they were a licensing company. So from there, after doing design direction, I was like, I want to try something different. I want to do something different. And so, so I left that company. I ended up working for a startup. And then I ended up working for Seymour Duncan, the, the company in Santa Barbara. Okay. And I were, ended up working them and doing their rebranding. That's where we ended up, I guess. So yeah. but I think the six month gap felt kind of like a forever oh, gap. Yeah. You know? One of the things I learned from that is relationships are really important. That's how I got my first job. Yeah. But also I remember keeping in touch with Rafael and other students. And it was one of the things that like you sustain yourself even mentally too, because you realize that you're not, you're not out there on your own. You're all, everybody's going through this, you know, and yeah. everybody's sort yeah. of figuring this out. Sure. But I think that helps in terms of where you, where you are in your career. In those positions, one thing that uh, I want to get back to with your current company. So in, in going through those few jobs before that, did it teach you, did you learn anything about like running a company? I worked as a, mostly in-house. So I worked for mm-hmm. other companies in their graphic design department. So it was very much, not necessarily a corporate environment, but they were segmented. So like they would have right. HR, they'd have administrative, like, you know, they have their financial department. Really, I was very design focused. So everything I learned with running my own business, I really had to figure out on my own. And there's a book out there called... Um, with design for love, work for money. This is why David Ayer, he does this other blog mm-hmm. called Identity Design. And that helped so much because he really simplifies the process about how you work with clients and about billing and getting yeah. a good contract in place. And it's so many things now that I read, I've been reading more books about trying to grow into more of a studio, which is like this other sort of animal. Right. Um, so I've read this, read this other book called Run Studio Run by Eli Altman. Yeah, it's a great book. They all say the same things, like always have a contract, do all these sort of things. I'm like, thank God I did those things. So it's just the two of you. Uh, you don't yeah. hire. You don't have another junior designer. Do you hire freelancers? We have partners. So for us, what we found is that specialization is also another thing that really helps in terms of gaining referrals and, and gaining a reputation. Is that the more specific your discipline is, the less competitors you have, and the more people can understand exactly what you're doing. Just this morning, I had a, an email from somebody saying, hey, I know somebody that needs branding. And that's a lot more easy for people to understand than somebody who, I think this guy does graphic design or websites or marketing, I'm not sure. So as a two-person team, I think we've been able to have the bandwidth to do this very specific discipline of doing brand strategy, identity, and then execution, utilizing our partners. We have certain things that we can do on our own, like where we do print collateral and environmental design or, or doing social media graphics or core touch points that we know we can execute. But we also have partners. I can't code that well. I know some web development, but we have a web developer that's a rock star developer that we work with. We work with a copywriting team that does excellent copy. We know a PR team that does public relations or does other marketing aspects. And so having that as sort of like in your wheelhouse, I think really is like sort of a new model, I think of working that is a result of online communications and also of the gig economy. I like this model because we can be very agile and be very flexible, but there sometimes you're missing a little bit of that synergy and sort of that in-house fluidity. Whereas like when we're doing, we're setting up projects where it's a little bit more expansive. We're having to get quotes from our partners. We're having right. to build out contracts, trying to also manage that and do QA and do all these sort of other things in order to make sure that the quality is as high as it can be. So how many years have you had the studio officially? So I think it was seven years. Seven in, years, okay. Seven or eight years. What are, what's the fluctuation? What's the highs and lows of running a business financially? I mean, this year has been very good for us. And so is last year. But previous to that, I mean, I'd say like when you're first starting out, you're 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 lucky to have something like fifty to sixty thousand a year, or something or seventy thousand a year. And your business gets older, you could probably get into six figures. Part of that is navigating, understanding, and 
figuring out what the pricing strategy is for you and understanding your value as well. One of the things I'm learning too is that you, I think that you can't, this is a service-based job. And if you're somebody like us, we're like a two-person team, you're doing most of the work, it's going to be, your hours are your, is your bread and butter. It's like the things that you're utilizing to work on this. And if part of that should be supplemented by some passive income sort of aspect to it. So like having passive income is going to allow you to be more flexible with your time and take on projects that will grow your brand even more. So I think those are the things that we're working on now is really like developing like assets and like right now I'm developing a font and like all these sort of things that will help to supplement your service base. So can you explain what a little bit more like what is passive income? Yeah, so passive income is 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 essentially money that you make when you're not doing anything that doesn't require management or doesn't require like when you're sleep you make money when you sleep. So like the font you're income. talking about, like you're designing yeah, a like font, a font and like you put it the files yeah, on a site and people can download it and pay Yeah, it. there's hardly any inventory management. There's right. like you probably want to do marketing, obviously, but the actual service, the actual thing that you're selling is not requiring you to be involved in any way. Oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, I want to switch gears and talk about DU a little bit. Can you uh, just talk about what your experience was like? Am I correct? Did, did you grow up in New England? You're from New England somewhere? Yeah, right? that's why. I, I mean, that's why our, I have the Red our, Sox thing. I, yeah, I, our connection with the Red Sox. So you grew up in New England. Like, how did you end up in Denver, Colorado? And what was the experience like at University of Denver? Well, I think, you know, I, I grew up in New Hampshire in like this really podunk town on the border of Massachusetts. And I remember thinking, I just got to get out of here. This is just too, <laughs> I like, know that story. like a very, like a very Bruce Springsteen sort of thing. And I didn't strap on myself on a motorcycle and go across town or anything, but I was just like, I want to see it out there. I need to see more than these four walls. But on a whim, I, I just applied to the University of Denver because I know that they had the EMAP program, which is great. It was, a, it was an excellent program. I'd visit the campus and everything. And they ended up giving me a pretty good scholarship. So I was like, yeah, this makes sense. I'll go out and they're giving me money. This makes like, I'll go and, and, and experience something different. I'm glad I did. Cause I, I really love Denver. Uh, I still have friends out there. I still, I still keep in contact with Raphael and, and some and my old roommate that I lived with oh, my yeah. first roommate for freshman <laughs> year. And I think the experience at DU, I thought, you know, the EMAD program is such an interesting program because EMAD also had a very much uh, a very much a framework that was conceptual. Most of the graphic designers I meet are, are very much involved in the, the technical discipline of it and the artistic discipline of it, which is really important, like formal aspects of it, where it's about color and typography. And that's such a big part of it. But what I really love about EMAD was that they really took a very high level conceptual standpoint on things and, and, to, and was really saying about, was really teaching about what are you saying with your design? Like, what are the things that you're communicating? That conceptual methodology, that sort of mindset carried on to me with pretty much everything I did after DU all up until when I'm doing into this studio today, which is, which is really about branding and branding is about creating identity and identity is about humanity and humanity is, and it's about communicating conceptual aspects of your company that will resonate emotionally with people. And I think that has this, I think EMAD, I don't know if it's changed now, but being around people like Deborah Howard and like being around people like Raphael and like yourself and like Timothy Weaver, you gain that conceptual thinking of being, uh, of really thinking about work that doesn't have to be about pixels and about color and, and it, I mean, about these sort of technical parts it's that, but the most, the governing part of it is what, what at the end of the day, what is it saying? And that's something oh, yeah. that came from DU, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to, ask you this yeah. was this was the 2004 world series am i correct in remembering that you skipped class to go to a world series game in st louis is that right <laughs> yes. okay yeah. tell that story tell that because i think i would have done the yes. same thing if i had world series tickets <laughs> and i was a red sox fan come on they don't they don't get to the world series that often so what how did you get tickets and what was the outcome because there were some faculty that, that yeah. were not pleased that you <laughs> skipped class to, to a World Series Red Sox game. 
<laughs> I don't regret it one ounce. Awesome. I don't regret any of it because my sister has always been in sports and she worked for the reason why she was in California, she worked for the Southern California Golf Association. But then she ended up working for William Morris Agency, which is like a talent agency. And I think somehow she was able to get these. Well, I mean, because they were going to the World Series, right? It had been like since the 19. 19- early 20th century, yeah. early, early 20th century since they had won one. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, uh, okay, and my sister's like, hey, we, I got tickets to this. It was the game that was going to clinch it, right? They, they had won uh, three games or something and they were going to win the series. Yeah, so did you go, go to the I'm like, winning game? I went to the winning game. And the and, oh, and thing wow. is like, I remember I took your, I was taking your class. I remember you were, now we're talking all casual and stuff like that, but you're like a serious professor. You were somebody who was like, you're, 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 you're <laughs> no, not going to take shit from anybody, you know? <laughs> and I was like, how am I going to tell Chris this? And I'm like, I was trying to write the email and like showing my sister. I'm like, does this look okay? I'm like, I don't know. I, I, how did I, I respond? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think you said something like, you were okay. You were, you were, you acquiesced and you were like, yeah, you can, you can go, but you were still a little bit hard about it. I can't remember the exact words, but I just remember me thinking, cause I, my mind was in like a, a like a, a tizzy at that point. I was like, we're going, I think he said yes. And then something else. I'm like, let's just go. <laughs> yeah. Just forget the rest of it. How I would respond today, which I don't think would be that different would probably have been something like, uh, yeah, that sounds great. Just know what you need to do for next class. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I respond no, these days <laughs> I think you said something about the Red Sox too which was okay <laughs> or something like they better win or something and then and then I can't oh, yeah, remember right. yeah like you had control I, over that yeah and then <laughs> I remember going and thinking wow this could be it I had texted my friend who lived in or I emailed my friend who lived in St. Louis I'm like can we stay at your house we're gonna crash on your couch and he's like yeah come and and we came and then we went and then they won and they won and it was weird winning because nobody at, in St. Louis wanted the Red Sox to win. So we're right. like, we looked at each other, we like hugged and we're like, we're, it was very anticlimactic because everybody <laughs> around us was uh, great. They all left super disappointed that St. Louis lost and it was just us two celebrating and we're like, <laughs> I'm sure there were a few more Red Sox fans there. <laughs> there were, but it was like, we we're like a very tiny minority, you know? And yeah. It was, but well, it was, I, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, name names i mean it was a it was a while ago but i do remember there were a couple of faculty who were perplexed by the idea that a student would skip class to go to a baseball game so yeah but you don't understand it's not just a baseball game it's like the baseball game yes if you're a red sox fan you know yeah this might not happen you know for another couple generations right yeah this is what people were thinking right i think at that time i was like really deep into it too and i was thinking like yeah this is something that i'm going to tell my grandkids i'm not going to tell them about but you know the the cold fusion class i took that day or whatever (laughs) it's going to be about (laughs) it's going to be about the game that i went to you know so i i'm sorry chris my apologies but i really don't no don't apologize for that (laughs) we gotta wrap up now it's time for the pop quiz it's kind of like you're you're back at du you we've talked a lot about your your business you're on your own doing your own thing you got to take care of everything first question is how do you back up your files time machine of course you got to use, you got to use the cloud because, and then also I like double back it up though. I, I put it on a sand disc and on, on the cloud. Uh, work beverage. Do you have a work coffee, beverage? Man. You got to have, coffee. you can do coffee. I mean, it's the lifeblood of our industry. Like if the co- like there's no coffee, there would be no graphic design. All right. After work beverage. I hate this because I saw Amanda also said whiskey too, but I also have whiskey or like, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's your time in, in uh, Denver. Okay, uh, baseball or cricket? Baseball, man. You got to say baseball. <laughs> what question is that? Uh, well, I don't know. You didn't work for cricket. Maybe you got into playing cricket. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> cricket lasts for like three days. Sketchbook, blank or gridded? Gridded, man. That's. Gritted. I mean, I have to tell you something. I know these short answers, but we had this late night conversation. I'm sure you have it with your wife. When we were pregnant, we were like, what are we going to name them? That would be really funny if we named all our kids after notebooks. What would be, <laughs> would be grid? Would she be in grid? It'd be a grid, right? And then another one would be Alina for lined. And then another one would be dot for dotted. Just dot. <laughs> yeah. And our kid's name is actually dot. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> Ended up being dot. Definitely have to have, my wife is definitely partial to dotted notebooks, which are grids, but without. Yeah. Them. They're grids. Yeah. Uh, type or image. Gotta do type, man. You gotta, type, gotta do type. type are, are the only things that are pictures of themselves. Music. Do you listen to music while you're working? Yes, yes. Music is a big component what, of this. What genre do you listen to? It kind of goes all over. Um, it depends, like from Jamaican Bluebeat to jazz to 
Radiohead to hip hop. When we have like a crunch time project, there's this go-to album in rainbows. Yeah. And it's like the album for if you want to be productive for both <laughs> of us. I would test you to try it out. All right. Uh, laptop or desktop? I've been, a la- it's always laptop. Uh, All right. Last right. question. This might be challenging. I don't know. East coast or West coast? Oh, why did you have to tell me that? Gosh, man, I think East Coast for, if you want a nice intellectual conversation, <laughs> then you're on, on the East Coast. But if you want, if you like, want if surf, you, you go to West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, my sister's boyfriend at this time, they went to, the, they went to New England one time and, it, and they bought a rental car. And the rental cars always come with the, the windshield scraper, right? <laughs> and then her, her boyfriend was from Australia and he picked it up and he's like, what is this thing? And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, if you only knew what that was like six o'clock in the morning just scraping off your car and you just get snowing and you're freezing all right i'll say west coast then i'll say west coast (laughs) yeah no scraping ice all right any final thoughts any last words of wisdom for all the young designers out there listen to chris's podcast uh, oh you're so nice uh, use Georgia in unexpected ways, <laughs> drink coffee as much as you can. And the last thing I would say is that know your worth, know your value, understand business side of it, because at the end of the day, you want to do what you love to do. And that's, if it's graphic design, you do have to know this, the business side and the business side, I think is also a fun part of it that you can learn. And I think that's about it. I think that's, I had such a great time, really fun time. And I hope I can speak to you again. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much, Larry. It was, it was great talking to you. Um, we'll definitely, we'll definitely catch up soon. We'll talk soon. Take care. All right. I'll see ya. Bye. See ya. Bye. We learned a few things from Larry. First, find some passive income. Make money while you sleep. Sounds like a good idea to me. Number two, develop a support system for your personal and professional lives. Uh, It might be a spouse, a family member, or friends. Hell, it might even be a former teacher. And finally, if you find yourself trying to decide between going to class and attending that once-in-a-lifetime event, well, as an educator, I can say, choose the once-in-a-lifetime event. You won't regret it. Thanks to Larry Wen of Outfit Branding and Design. If you have any comments or questions for me or any of the guests, please leave them in the comments. And subscribe so you can catch the next episode of Design Futures. Until next time, go learn something. Your future depends on it. Thanks for listening. See ya.